The Battle of Hastings in 1066 is often cited as one of the most important in English history. A battle not usually mentioned, but equally important, is the Battle of the Medway in 43 CE. Emperor Claudius ordered four Roman legions and auxiliaries totaling roughly 40,000 men under the leadership of Aulus Plautius to invade Britain. The first major battle occurred against 150,000 Britons, led by brothers Togodumnus and Caractacus, rulers of the Catavalloni at the River Medway. The Roman side held future emperors in Vespasian and Galba, in addition to strong overall leadership and experience. Imagine the scale of the invasion if you were one of the Britons' messengers on the watch for incoming Romans. Imagine the sight as the Roman armada slinked into view. First on the horizon, 300 and more ships slowly coming towards you. To the Britons, it may have been akin to an ICBM inbound missile news report for us in the modern era. Likely hopelessness and panic and required careful political reining in by the chiefs and druids. However, while the Britons were aware the Romans would be coming at some future point and had messengers indicating their arrival, they chose to let the Romans land unopposed. After a week of defensive fort building and Aulus Plautius' scouts seeing no major enemy massings, he ordered the general advance. Events were now underway that would see the Britons' rule of southeast England and within 50 years the rest of England give way to the might of Rome. As the Roman legions approached the river Medway, Aulus Plautius took the high ground to the rear center east of the line where he would have been able to survey the surrounding area on his and the other side of the Medway. He had Legion 9 Hispana take up the right line closer to the Thames estuary with their Batavian auxiliary troops likely just to their south. The Britons in turn held two strategic points on the west side of the Medway a tactical HQ for the commander's decision-making up on the prominent high ground overlooking the river, and the main HQ where the remainder of the force was massed on the lower ground, near the likeliest Roman crossing point of the Medway. Legion 14 Gemina began a slow mock massing of troops to convince the Britons, many of whom were spread along the west bank of the Medway, that they would be attacking from this point. Legion 2 Augusta were pulled up just left of the line, but out of sight in an area where the terrain east of the Medway was swampy and not a suspected crossing point. Meanwhile, Legion 20 Victrix pulled up the flank to prevent any attacks from the south where there was no water barrier. With the legions in position, the Batavians, who specialized in their ability to cross rivers in full armor and weaponry, stealthily crossed the river to the right of the line. They avoided detection by the Britain Tactical HQ and continued on to their objective, which was to take out the chariot horses. This would not only cripple the Britons' mobility throughout the battle, it no doubt enraged them and threw additional uncertainty as to where the attack was coming from, with Legion 14 still in the midst of their deceptive massing to the south. As the horses were being killed, Vespasian took Legion Augusta II across the Medway upstream further south of the deceptive massing point and attacked the Britons in an attempt to create a beachhead on the west bank of the Medway. The area chosen by Vespasian and Roman command, a piece of land that narrowed before it opened up, creating sort of a virtual island. In short, the perfect beachhead. Now imagine what it would have been like as a legionnaire on the front line. What made battles in the pre-industrial age so much different than now is how intimately close most of the fighting was. How close a soldier had to be to his enemy to land the killing blow. Now imagine the lopsided volumes under which the Roman legionnaires usually fought. In this battle alone, the ratio was roughly four to one. And if you consider the legions and auxiliaries not involved on both sides, the ratio likely crept up to six to one. That was a typical scenario under which the Roman legionnaire would have his discipline and courage tested. Now further imagine the length of these battles. Modern boxers and MMA fighters with absolutely top level cardiovascular conditioning are tired after short progressive rounds with small rests, albeit having to pace themselves aggressively. 
Ancient battles often raged for hours. So similarly, pacing and proper conditioning, critical. Even with the lines shifting in and out to the rear and the front, proper alertness was critical. Think of the most exhausted you have ever been. Now, put yourself in the line of fire, on the front line. Your will to live would have to be so very strong, not only to stay alive, but fight off the fight or flight instinctual urges that would no doubt constantly be peppering your brain. The fighting was furious, but the Romans held their ground through hours of fighting, not advancing, but neither having to fall back over the river. Vespasian was able to establish the beachhead as night fell to end the first day of fighting. Gnaeus Hosidius Geta then brought his 14th legion into the beachhead where they would leapfrog Legion Augusta the next day, and Augusta would then take on the defensive of this new position to prevent attacks to their south and west. Dawn the next day saw Geta attack northwards, cutting deep channels of carnage into the Britons' lines. Legion 9 Hispana also moved into the beachhead to shore up both the defensive position of Augusta and 14's attack to the north under Geta. Fighting continued, with Geta almost being captured after an attempt to encircle the enemy, but he was ultimately successful. The Britons fell back, with Togo Dumnus falling in the battle likely just before or during the Britons falling back to the higher ground of the Britons' tactical HQ. Legion 20 Victrix, which had been guarding the flank against a Briton sneak strike from the south, now pontoon bridged the Medway just north of the island crossing point. Britannic leader Caractacus fled north with the remaining Britons to regroup, but the main battle had been won, and many more Britons were killed during the retreat. The aftermath of the battle would see Roman rule over the majority of present-day England and Wales for another 400 years. That timescale is one of the most impressive aspects, considering many modern occupations only last years or scant decades. As the Roman rule began to disintegrate in the face of mass Saxon migrations onto the British Isles, the rule of major portions of the island would be Saxon and Viking, until of course the Normans came in 1066.